Welcome to Copying the Candlestick. This is a virtual talk about the recreation of the Gloucester Candlestick, one of the most beautiful and exciting medieval objects of art uh, that there is in this country. It's wonderful metalwork. Um, I'm Celia Thompson, the Canon Chancellor at Gloucester Cathedral, and it was my dream when I first came here to think about how we could possibly do better than a photograph of having our Gloucester candlestick back in Gloucester. And I thought it was a pipe dream. But thanks to modern technology, we now have this marvelous replica and you can see all the wonderful detail uh, in all its glory. And it has just been such an exciting project and I hope you enjoy hearing and learning how it was recreated with today's technology. And uh, you'll come and see it for yourself in the future when it's displayed up in our lovely medieval Tribune Gallery. And now I'm going to hand over to Dr. Amelia Nolson, who uh, did the digital photography and then uh, Paul Ruffin from Renishaw, who will uh, talk about the transforming it into the metalwork. Hello, my name is Amelia Nelson. I'm a 3D artist and heritage specialist um, working with 3D technology um, across the UK. Uh, it has been such an honor to have the ability to 3D scan this object and I hope me talking about how I did this and the process of it um, is of interest to you. So, 3D scanning the Gloucester candlestick. Um, uh, the approach for this, for scanning the candlestick, was in two ways. First of all, we had to separate the individual elements of the candlestick, so its middle, its base, and the top of it with the bowl. Um, there was such an incredible amount of detail in each object and it was so important that I was able to capture all of it. So it involved camp scanning it in uh, sections and the point clouds, the three images that you can see here, um, represent all the different segments that we went through um, scanning each individual piece. Um, so it was a matter of capturing detail over and over and over again. It was quite a long time. It took over a day to get all the information we needed. And then it took me over a week to put all these individual pieces together. There were some challenges along the way, which I will hopefully try to articulate um, throughout this short talk. So the first thing was, is that once we had all this raw data, so this is the scan processes from the base of the candlestick, um, the image, the, the messy image you can see is all the individual scans and segments that were cre that were captured for creating these the base. These were then cleaned, processed, analysed, and then they were manually layered over one another. So you ended up with a an object which you can see in the middle, which roughly resembles the base of the candlestick. This was then further cleaned, processed, and rendered into a solid object which is the finalised object you can see in purple. These were then, this finalised object was then cross-referenced with images that I took on a day to make sure that all the detail, the faces, the lettering, the intricate uh, metalwork and carvings that are present on the candlestick were also captured in the 3D scan. This process was repeated for the middle section so you can see um, in the top, we have a lot of different colours. These are all the segments that we captured and a lot of unwanted data, so background noise. These were then cleaned. We did a texture overlay to show, make sure we were capturing the, the texture look correct and it was overlaying properly. And then again, finalised into the, into the final section, the final, the final section. And then finally, the top. So again, you have this mess of data um, for the top of the candlestick. Now, this was a really challenging one because we had to make sure that the internal bowl lined correctly with the outer, external structure of the bowl um, and made sure that 
all the images were aligned correctly. This took a lot of processing, a lot of time, um, a lot of me really zoomed in on the screen to make sure that everything was perfectly lined up or as best as that we could. And then the, the merge scans had to be uh, processed and cleaned and again cross-referenced with images that we took of the day to make sure that they were um, it was all correct and I wasn't missing data and that anything that had to be cleaned was. This was a very long process. Um, my computer was on for three days solid while we were rendering these objects all together and it produced a huge amount of data um, and images and scans. Um, so the fun, there's a lot of work that's gone behind me, gone into making sure that the scanning um, was correct. And then you have uh, an image of the finalized bowl on top of the, the candlestick on the top. And I just love the fact that we've been able to, you know, capture the writing and the faces of the monkeys and the griffins and everything that's on the side of these, this wonderful object. So some of the challenges um, that I faced as a 3D spelling expert was the capturing the whole surface of the candlesticks from all angles, including the underneath, making sure they all aligned correctly. Um, working in a 3D space means that you have to make sure that the underneath and the left and the right and the tops and the bottoms are all kind of aligned correctly. This object is incredibly reflective in nature um, and it meant that I had to repeatedly scan the same surface over and over again to make sure that I wasn't missing any data and as I said before this resulted in some very large um, scan sizes or file sizes um, and then finally um, aligning multiple raw scans to create one finalized object particularly with the base so we had over 40 uh, scans of segments of the base making sure those all aligned correctly and uh, were in the right um, 3D frame and aligned with other objects uh, was a real challenge. It was one I greatly enjoyed because of, from, from my part as uh, someone that works with heritage, um, heritage institutions and museums is that I got to really um, explore this object in a 3D way and that was such a privilege. Uh, so I just wanted to talk about talk to you about the caption, the detail. As I said, it was such an honour to, to view the intricate nature of these objects, especially when we're working in the finalising processes of making sure that all the detail was correct and everything was aligned um, in a in a correct manner. Um, so I think my favourite is this this wonderful monkey on the top, and then we've got these wonderful faces from the base with these, um, I believe they're dogs. Um, with this man um, again and then my favourite section has to be the, the middle section and making sure that this was correct was probably one of the hardest bits making sure that all the, the, the writing aligned and that you could see the intricate detail of this object from, it's from the griffins on the side or the man climbing up the side of the pole with the knife and the dagger um, so this was a long process. Um, it took me about a week, a week and a half to process all this data to make sure it was correct. We had two, two visits to the ZNA and two scanning sessions. We did a proof of concept and then we did a final scan to make sure that um, the scanning techniques that we were using were correct and that when we were scanning everything, well, the candlestick was safe and secure we worked a lot with the curators there uh, because I did have to uh, turn the, the base of the candlestick upside down to scan the base. I did have to um, position this object in, in ways that it wouldn't normally be in and we had to make sure that that was safe and secure. Uh, so that's my presentation. I'm sorry it's short. Hello everybody, my name is Paul Govan. I'm the customer trainer manager for Rennie Short PLC. This is a short presentation on the Rennie Shaw involvement with the candlestick. Okay, so a little bit about our company to begin with. Uh, we were actually um, conceived by Sir David McMurtry, our uh, founder, and he was the inventor of a device called the Touch Trigger Pro, which actually solved uh, a measurement problem on Concorde engines when he worked in uh, uh, the Rolls-Royce in Bristol. 
Our headquarters are in Wooden under Edge in Gloucestershire. Uh, and in 1984, we had a uh, full listing on the uh, London Stock Exchange. Currently, we have subsidiaries in 37 countries and approximately 5,000 employees. Our business sectors include industrial metrology, so manufacturing measurement, position encoders, which is measurement feedback, additive manufacturing, 3D metal printing, and then healthcare, including neurology, cranial, maxillofacial, dental, and spectroscopy products. Our customer bases include aerospace, automotive, electronics, scientific research analysis, and a few others, to name a few. So, the Gloucester Candlestick uh, timeline. So, in February, March 2017, Renishaw hosted a University of the Third Age uh, group at our headquarters in South Gloucestershire. At the end of the talk, one of the visitors um, asked about additive manufacturing and whether or not we could uh, print a candlestick and I kind of went yeah of course we can and that was the end of the story so I thought anyway uh, sometime later an email arrived from the cathedral archivist um, but unfortunately my name was misspelt so it bounced away and eventually we got it back about a year or so later uh, if that hadn't happened, we wouldn't be sat here today with this candlestick. Uh, it would have just got lost in the ether. So, uh, personally, I was given the permission to pursue the project, but with a lot of provisos. There was legal agreements that needed to be drawn up between the cathedral, um, the V&A, Renishaw, and Amelia Knowles, who you've just heard from. Um, and it was agreed that we would do the printing of the object provided they could find somebody to do the scanning and that's where uh, Amelia was found uh, to be the right person to do this. So after the agreement from the V&A there were some trial prints that went on um, and in July 2018 Amelia shared those trial scans with us. My colleagues ascertained that they were good enough uh, for us to at least give it a go, uh, which we did. And the legal documentation started the same day, but finished five months later. So we couldn't actually do anything. Um, 7th of February 2019, myself, uh, Rebecca Phillips, Theatre Archivist and Amelia Olson met at the V&A, uh, where we were given uh, unprecedented access to this beautiful thing uh, by Becky Knotts uh, and that's when Amelia started doing the scans. So here's how the um, candlestick actually arrived to us in a wicker basket and a load of tissue paper and all the bits lying in it. Uh, there's an image of Amelia actually scanning at the uh, base on her homemade turntable and there's some of the detail that we got initially. As you can see, what Amelia uh, managed to get initially and what she uh, sent us in the final rendition was amazing, totally different. We, the, the data was manipulated and the, the trials were started and we started to produce it in uh, titanium. But we found there was a problem with the open fretworks and the creatures and the floor and floor. It was very difficult to get the level of detail that we wanted. So here is uh, a quick shot of a 3D printer layering a couple of layers. So what you're seeing there is the printer lasering a layer of powder and laying it down on the bed and when it's finished it will drop down a little bit it will uh, cover over again and then print the next layer above it you can see on the screen on the right hand side that the base layer is actually 4350 4, layers at 30 microns thick 30 microns is about half the thickness of a human hair So by June 2019, we'd uh, 
made a decision to change to an aluminium powder, which meant that we get much better detail. It was quicker to print, quicker and easier to clean up. So there's an example of how all three parts are looked at at some point during the, uh, during the build process. So by October 2019, we had an exact replica of the original, complete with all its damage and dents. Or did we? The patina is different, the material is different, the weight of it is different, the pricket with the, for holding the candle is different. And then we added one small but necessary design change. We actually added into the, uh, into the foot uh, of, of one side a small step so the, pot, the candlestick will actually stand up straight. If you do actually look at it in the v &A, there's a very small plastic step under the one leg. And this is purely from where it's been dropped over the years. But we decided to leave it as it was. So in October 2019, there was a sneak preview. And Sue is a volunteer at the cathedral, volunteer guide. And it was her husband who actually came and badgered me in the first place. Uh, by February 2020, we unveiled the first two replicas, but the patina had not been applied. So some detailed breakdown now of the part themselves. How long did it take? So about 40 hours to prep the scans. So Amelia had done all this good work of uh, taking all the noise out of her scans, but we had to put some back in, effectively put some back in, and that's all part of the supports that you hold it during the build process. Took about 40 hours to uh, complete each set, uh, about four or five kilos of powder per set, uh, and of that about a kilo is scrap because of the supports. And then the post process, i.e. Uh, finishing it once uh, from Renshaw's point of view, and about 20 hours per set. So there's quite a lot of work going into it. So a couple of thank yous. Uh, Amelia for the uh, scan data in the first place. Without it, we couldn't have done anything. <coughs> uh, Becky Knott, who was the assistant who is the assistant curator at the BNA uh, for allowing us access, but uh, for uh, pushing me all the way through the whole process. Uh, and then to Ralph uh, Fawkes, uh, Renishaw DMC leader, and Adrian Prendergast, who actually did all of the work. One of the things I found fascinating when we were in the VA with you was that you were using really modern technology to scan it and really simple technology to actually support and hold it. And you mentioned that you had to be really careful about how you propped it up. So can you tell people a little more about, about your homemade turntable? <laughs> Turn, turntable. Uh, yes. So, um... When working with museum, uh, so I am a curator by trade originally. Uh, before I got into being a 3D artist, I worked with um, multiple museums. And when you're working with local and regional museums, you have to be resourceful. Um, I was finding that when we were working with 3D technology, um, the easiest way to capture an object in the round is with a turntable. Um, so I made a... Um, very simple turntable using a plastic lazy susan and door handles that were super glued on and this was my test i then made a proper one which is electric that plugs into my computer and turns and i can control the speed of this as a curator i soon realized that having a turntable that was electric that was electric and controlled with a museum object on it was a little bit too nerve-wracking for me so um I, I just had these horrible visions of something going wrong and this priceless object flying off into the distance. Um, so I have continued to use my makeshift turntable and it has served me well in many institutions, including the British Museum and the v &A and um, all sorts of um, places that I've worked. So this is what I do and then I have my own, I bring, I have pyrozo and plastic supports and stuff which are used in museums across the UK, across the world even, to support the object in um, 
when it's being turned and manipulated. Um, but yeah, my um, I have always used my my trusty plastic and wooden turntable. Well, um, I I wonder if if I could ask you um, when you uh, brought the um, uh, replicas, the finished replicas. We had a long conversation, and it seems to have turned into a bit of a personal project for you. And I wondered if you could say a bit about your connection. Um, in a way, it's a bit of a personal project. Um, it, both my children went to school here, so, um, you know, Gloucester's my home city, uh, so I do have that connection. Uh, I didn't know anything about the candlestick before uh, I was and, uh, actually finding out a bit more about it and then having the privilege of going to see it and get hold of this thing in, in the flesh, as it were, was a real... Uh, Real moment. I mean, it's counted as one of the VNA's top 20 artifacts. It's listed on their website and their pages, mm -hmm. and it's got a very prominent position in the in the VNA. So, yeah, that's how that's how I got involved, and I just think it's a great thing. It's been really good. I mean, it's been one of the um, I think groundbreaking uses of this type of technology, and I can only see it being used more for artifacts and things like that. Oh, that's really exciting and I hope that uh, other people um, will uh, go on a similar voyage mm. of discovery coming to see it and looking at all the detail yeah. and feel it's part of our, our heritage. Yeah, it certainly yeah. is, yes. Just a related question, I just wonder out of interest, your company makes lots of medical parts, functional devices and so on. Uh, what were your colleagues' reactions when they saw the final candidacy? Um, well, we shared it internally on our own internal website, and some of the uh, put it this way, it's been a huge PR success internally and externally. It's been in all of the trade uh, magazines. Uh, it's been in the Church Times. It's been on the TV. So, um, it, it, yeah, the, most colleagues have really warmed to it, and some of the comments back on our internal SharePoint have been really, really positive. Final one from me, which is probably back to Amelia and remembering from the scanning side of things. You mentioned about how difficult it was to match up the bowl of the top part with the outside. Yeah. And I remember a, a little thing that you needed to use to be able to kind of get that semi-spherical semi bowl to actually be able to be stitched together afterwards. When, we 3D, when aligning 3D scans, um, the easiest thing to do is use markers. Now, obviously we can't, with heritage objects, you can't use sticky pieces of, um, like stickers or anything like that, because we would never in a million years try to damage an object. So what we did was I got a small piece of tissue paper, screwed it up into a little wall and then placed it in the, um, the, the rim of the bowl so when we were scanning it because the, the internal bowl was scanned in four sections and then they were aligned and then they were dropped into the external structure um, but when you're working with scan data and aligning scan data you have to have some marker or the computer will think that scan data with very little surface detail is just the same and it will line up over and over and over again I didn't want four quarter circles stuck on top of each other I wanted an actual bowl um, so again being a, a curator that used to work in regional galleries um, I was resourceful and we got a little piece of uh, tissue paper placed it in the set in the center so that there was some some distinguishing feature that I could then delete afterwards but use to map the objects onto each other. In the past we've used um, small pieces of pyrozo, we've used tissue paper, we've used rice paper or I've used rice paper um, just to give some distinguishing feature um, so that the scan data doesn't overlap and then you end up with just one surface that's multiplied four times which is not what we want. We actually left the tissue paper in okay uh, we figured that it's part of the story Okay. So, uh, I decided on my own, I, you know, I was chatting to some of the guys at work about it and should we leave it in, shouldn't we? And they said, what is it? And I told them and they decided that with, with me that 
making the final decision that it'd be worthwhile living in because it does show the history. So this thing's got all the marks and knocks and dents and breaks and bumps and lumps all over it, including some of the repairs that you can see inside it. Um, so we thought, why not? It's a really lovely story, actually. And as you know, we, we have created a new object and I suppose in a hundred years, people might even be doing research about the replica. Maybe, and maybe in 900 maybe. years. Maybe <laughs> in 900 years, there'll be uh, a poor archivist somewhere trying to figure out what this tiny, tiny knot <laughs> 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 yeah, Maybe, maybe. Uh, I'm Rebecca Phillips, I'm the Cathedral Archivist, and I just want to say on behalf of the Cathedral, on my own behalf, and on behalf of everyone who's going to come and enjoy this replica, a really genuine and sincere thank you to Amelia to Paul, to everyone else at Renishaw who's been part of making it, to Pangolin who applied a beautiful gilded finish to the replicas that we've now got here at the cathedral, and to everyone else who shared and enjoyed being part of this talk. Um, we hope you've enjoyed hearing a bit more about how the replicas were made, and we look forward to welcoming you in spring to come and see the replicas in their new home here at the cathedral. So thank you. <laughs>